Well, as we all know, everyone was shocked, saddened, uh, and just incredibly surprised at the at the horrible news concerning the death of Robin Williams. Uh, and one of my first thoughts was an old friend of mine, uh, an actor, a writer, a comedian named Robert Wall. Uh, Robert uh, and I went to college together in Houston, uh, along with a good group of people, uh, Randy and Dennis Quaid, and a lot of good folks came out of that, that class. And uh, Robert has gone on to... Uh, TV fame with his uh, HBO series Arliss about the sports agent. Uh, did a lot of work in movies. He was in uh, Bull Durham. Uh, he was in the original Batman with Michael Keaton. Uh, and he did a movie called Good Morning Vietnam with Robin Williams and a great cast, including Forrest Whitaker and others. And that my first thought was to uh, give Bob a call because he knew Robin Williams from both the movie set and from their years doing stand-up together across the country. And so I gave him a call at his home in L.A., and this is our conversation. Robert, let me let me ask you first of all, and you, you were telling me you've gotten lots of calls about this. You guys worked together on uh, one of his greatest performances in the mind of most people, and that, that would be Good Morning Vietnam. And I remember you and I talking uh, right after you'd done it. You, uh, you were telling me stories, some of which we can't tell, but you were telling me stories. It was an incredibly you know, fun set, fun production to work in, to be a part of. Absolutely. It, first of all, it was all guys. You know, you're doing a movie, uh, you know, everybody's in the Army, and you're not going to war, so you're not getting dirty, you're not getting shot, you're, you're in a recording studio, you know, you're mm-hmm. in a radio studio. So, and it was fun, and we were all hanging out together, and Barry Levinson was wonderful. And, you know, there was great talent in that movie, a lot of which, were, unfortunately, no longer with us. You had uh, Bruno Kirby Bruno and Jake Kirby, yeah. Walsh and Noble Willingham. And, of course, you also had uh, uh, Forrest Whitaker mm-hmm. and uh, Richard Portnow and, and these great people. And it was just fun every day. It was hot. <laughs> Sorry, no, it was hot. <laughs> but Robin was having as much fun as anybody. It was a perfect vehicle for him. And uh, he would, he was, you know, he's totally, uh, the thing about Robin Williams was, you know, I, I first met him years earlier because of uh, the stand-up. We started out as stand-up comics at the same time. And so we knew each other. There was a kinship. There was a trust. And, we, and in fact, I would be feeding him lines, you know, when he was doing his improvisation and stuff like that. So, but the thing about Robin was the spirit and the generosity. There, there's a lot of great, talented people. Mm-hmm. There really are. There's quite a few. Maybe not as many in that rarefied era as Robin Williams. Mm-hmm. But there are great comic artists, and there are great artists. But there are very few in Robin Williams's category as a human being, as a humanitarian. Uh, the, the helpfulness. The, Robin was always there for you. You know, people remember, of course, Comic Relief, how much he did for that, starting mm-hmm. that with Billy and Whoopi. Uh, Robin was a San Francisco comic. And that's where he started, was in San mm-hmm. Francisco. And when the AIDS epidemic breaks out in the early 80s, Robin, or in the mid-80s, whatever, Robin is front and center on this whole thing, and doing everything he can. I happen to know a couple of comics who contracted the disease, and he anonymously supported for years. Christopher Reeve was his roommate in Juilliard. When Christopher Reeve has a terrible accident, Robin Williams is the guy there for him, and, and supported him quite often. And gave money. You know, Robin Williams was there for everybody. And he never hurt, you know, he was the guy. And, uh, I, you know, you don't hear too many bad things about Robin Williams. You know, yeah, mm-hmm. you'll hear a couple of comics bitching about material yeah. being taken. Yeah, which is, <laughs> yeah, probably. But it's minor stuff compared to the world of what he did uh, as far as a human being, as far as comedy. Uh, he, you know, he made that. He feels mm-hmm. small. You know, a lot attributed to years ago, I thought, I think, to a Warren Beatty. One said, you know, when you meet somebody, you may not remember exactly what he said, but you'll always remember how they made you feel. Mm-hmm. And Robin Williams made people feel better. Well, yeah, Christopher Reeve said in his book, and, and, and a lot of people, I mean, I know they were roomies at Juilliard. They were both broke actors, uh, but both had gotten into some classes that, that very few people were selected for. And uh, after the accident... Uh, Reeve wrote in his book that, that Williams came in pretending to be, with a face mask on, pretending to be a, uh, an eccentric Russian proctologist who immediately had to do a rectal exam. I mean, the first thing he apparently thought of was, i got to get this guy's spirits lifted a bit. That's great. Yeah. That's that's just and Robin would be the first one making jokes today, probably. You know, Robin would, you know, Robin would be making jokes today. Make no mistake about it. 
Yeah. You know, there'd be, there'd be nice jokes. That, you know, if somebody wrote somebody was today. He goes, today I'm wrestling Andy Kaufman. I'll let you know how it goes. <laughs> you know, it's yeah. like so. Robin would be doing stuff like that. And I remember the story. What was interesting about the Good Morning Vietnam, though, as I thought yesterday, is I remember one day we were out uh, somewhere on location, and the book that was very popular then was Bob Woodward's Wired, mm-hmm. which was about the Belushi. Yeah. And his death and everything. And people were reading it. It was, it was a hot number. Except you had to read it away from Robin, because if you remember, Robin is with Belushi and De Niro hours before Belushi ODs. That's they right. were all at the Chateau Marmont together getting high. That's right. <laughs> so you kept it away from Robin. And because, you know, you got the star of a movie. He can go crazy. He sees that. And he can say, get him off the set, get him fired. What are you doing? And somebody, and I forgot what it was, but Robin caught the eye of somebody who was reading the book. And he smiled at him, and he said, how's the book? And the guy, sheepishly, you know, and so it's pretty good. It's okay. He goes, yeah. And Robin had gotten clean right after that, remember? Robin, mm-hmm. uh, you know, sobered up. And he said, yeah. He goes, that was interesting. And that's all he said, wistfully. Mm-hmm. He didn't go into it, you know. He uh, kind of made a half joke, and you know, but he said, that was interesting. Mm-hmm. Uh, but uh, he could have done a lot of things. But I remember that moment watching him, and... and I flashed back on that yesterday. Yeah, I, I, I did flash back on that yesterday. Well, we knew we knew about the drug and the booze problems. Uh, he he was quite honest about that, pretty upfront yeah. in public. Yeah. Uh, when you worked with him, though, did you? And I tell you what occurred to me was I I, I know obviously for for so many of us were huge fans. His his idol was Jonathan Winters, who was another one of those manic, intensely creative, comedic minds who also had emotional problems, had a big breakdown. And also had depression problems, huge big, depression problems. Yeah, big breakdown at one point in his life, uh, interrupted his career. Did you sense any of that, uh, uh, along with the drug and the booze stuff, but but any of the, the depression issues? No, I didn't, I have to say, although yeah. I had heard about some of it. Uh, I, I was with his manager uh, a couple of months ago, and I said, how's he doing? Because it was just with the TV show. I said, is he enjoying it? He said, eh, it's okay. And... Um, so and I'd seen Robin uh, ooh, about a year ago when he did the play on Broadway, the Bengali the Bengali Tiger. Mm-hmm. I'd seen that on Broadway and spoke with him briefly after the show. Uh, but I didn't. I, he was much calmer than I remember him. Uh, he just gotten married. He was with his new wife Susan, and he seemed very happy as far as that. But I, you know, to speculate is ridiculous on my part. Yeah. Uh, this is you know what was going on two years ago. The uh, but depression in comics is not, it's, it's not rare. I, <laughs> it, it's just something you have to deal with. First of all, first of all, you're in show business, so it's a question of working. Although Robin was, I'm sure, even though I, even though I know how much you know, he was supporting you know, how many people and how many projects and how many things he was doing, mm-hmm. but uh, Robin was, could have worked. Uh, but depression, and you've got to make people laugh. People expect you to make them laugh to be funny all the time, and you're constantly trying to come up with new things, and you're constantly fighting an audience, and comedy especially, mm-hmm. which is generational. Comedy is very generational. Yeah. You know, you, you know, use a couple of comics who can get through the younger generation, and each generation is different mm-hmm. in comedy. What they laugh at. Try finding a younger generation who really watches a Woody Allen movie. Try that sometime. Yeah. The, um, with exceptions. But, so you're fighting that with comedy, so that makes it more difficult there. Uh, so, you know, you've got a lot of things to deal with. I, I, that's a good example. I was watching Sleeper with my 16-year-old daughter. And didn't find it nearly as funny as I did after all these years. Yeah. Right, and also try having to watch one of the current Woody Allen films. Good luck with that. <laughs> That's at least a throwback. That one's when he's doing the funny ones. So, I mean, try, 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 now there's a few people, there's, there's some, I mean, but uh, yes, yeah, it, comedy is incredibly generational. How many of the young comics, you know, does the other generation find funny? This is, it's, it's, it's very tough. More than, Lauren Michaels told me about this. Uh, how when people would audition for Saturday Night Live when he first started, people would come up and uh, they would do Bill Murray impressions. He said, like, Adam Sandler would come in and do a Bill Murray impression. He goes, then the next group came in and did Adam Sandler impressions. And, you know, you know now they're doing Will Ferrell. You know, so it, that's all, you know, and Will Ferrell's yeah. the old man now. Yeah, so like, like generals. Comedy, comedy is very, very generational. Uh, gen- generals fighting the last war. But I will tell you this, though. Uh, my 16-year-old also said, her generation still loved Robin Williams. They, I, it's not like I had to explain to her who this guy was. 
Well, no, no, no. no. Robbie, yeah, but, he crossed. You know, but, he crossed a lot of generations. Well, Mrs. Doubtfire would do that, and of course, she's still active in like Night at the uh, Museum and Aladdin. Mm-hmm. You know, so he does that. Does cross you know cross generations? He stayed. He stayed current. Yeah, he stayed contemporary. But you, I was talking about comics in general. Yeah, uh, it, it, it is. It is. Uh, it's tough for everybody. Have you talked to any of your your colleagues, uh, Bob? You've been doing stand up since gosh, we were in college, I think. Uh, have you talked to any of your friends? I mean, has this hit everybody? Yes. Yeah. Yes. I mean, especially the guys we all started with. Uh, I had to tell a couple of them, and everybody's bummed out. Everybody, to a person, is bummed out because mm-hmm. he was one of the good guys. Mm-hmm. He was, you know, he was almost he felt indestructible. And, and and but again, it has to do with what a good guy he was. People loved Robin. Robin, you needed something, you needed money. So I'm sure I can't imagine how many guys Robin gave money to, mm-hmm. uh, how many causes, how many, and supported and. and uh, he was just a great human being. You know, if you would have asked me this last week, mm-hmm. uh, I was doing it. They were talking about Rob Wayne. I said, yeah, I remember Rob Wayne's one of the 10 great human beings I've ever met in my life. So forget the comedy. You know, he, what he did was he used his celebrity to advance causes and to help people that he thought had less and needed help. And without making, you know, even though Rob was quite political, mm-hmm. he wasn't, you know, he wasn't uh, aggressively confrontational. He would yeah. tell jokes and do stuff like that, but he wasn't aggressively confrontational. Yeah, I, I would I would have had no idea of his politics. I could guess them, but yeah, he never oh, made, yeah. Never made a watched, deal of it. Yeah, yeah, you watch his, his stand up. He's always telling jokes and, sure. and, and doing stuff. And yet, it, like again, it wasn't. He was making points, but it wasn't mean spirited. Mm-hmm. You know, so uh, yeah, boy, what a waste. I, I know, I know, I know. That, that, I think that's what everybody's thinking today. What a waste, you know. What? It, yeah, even my wife Barbara, who knew Robin, mm-hmm. probably before I did, uh, because he was, she was on the West Coast when he started. I, I remember I was a comic in the late seventies. I'm I come out of college and I'm starting out doing stand up comedy uh, in the improv in New York. Yeah, you're in New and, York, right? And we had a good group of people who were starting up. It was. Uh, there was good comics. It was, it, was, it was George Wallace and Larry David and Jerry Seinfeld and Gilbert Gottfried mm-hmm. and myself and uh, Keenan Wayne. So we had a good group. We thought, you know, we're pretty good here. And But we kept hearing about this kid coming from the West Coast named Robin Williams who could blow away rooms at like you know, at 2 o'clock in the morning, which mm-hmm. was very difficult to do. And then he came by one time with his managers, and he went on stage, and it was like nothing he'd ever seen before doing his stuff, uh, mm-hmm. going into the audience, playing with him. There was an energy into the room. It, it, was, it was like somebody, you had comics who were great comics and really strong, but he was suddenly playing rock and roll. <laughs> he was suddenly you know, turning on, it was like Hendrix suddenly turning on the guitar. Yeah. So, uh, so that, and mm-hmm. so I knew him since way back then. And of course it was partying way back then. So uh, I, I, we have to wrap this up at some point, Bob, and I, I know you got lots of people to talk to. Um, I, this is just it's so out of the blue. Uh, apparently, from what we know now, no suicide note. It, it almost seems like it was just something decided to do at that moment. Uh, no one will ever know. But uh, he just this leaves a lot of a lot of emotional wreckage behind for everybody that either knew him or did or just knew his work. Uh, he was a very special person, and uh, there's a few guys, for my own taste, on the world, you know, you could see the outpouring of the world, but I mean, look at everybody from Obama to President to everybody coming out mm-hmm. for Robin Williams. He touched everybody, and that's, geez, how many people say that? Um, I, think he, I think he'd be overwhelmed uh, and very embarrassed mm-hmm. and insecure by all the... Uh, accolades today and the outpouring and uh, we're going to miss him the world is the world is less funny today it's robert wool uh actor writer comedian uh and a good friend robert i thank you all, all the best Roger. thank you bye-bye